So, Tony, uh, we continue to see the merging of asset classes, traditional asset managers introducing more liquid strategies into their portfolios in order to diversify, reduce risk and increase returns. Retail investors may now even have the opportunity to enter the alternative markets. From a technology perspective, what are firms introducing these new asset classes need to do to their operating models to ensure they can maximize alpha, but I suppose also address the increased level of client demands that come with these asset classes? Okay, well, I think there are a couple of ways that we can we can look at this. Firstly, the, the funds themselves and the products themselves that are coming to market. So we're seeing more wrapper style funds in both the UCID and uh, 40 app mutual uh, fund becoming more popular now, whereby you have uh, uh, a strategy or a sub strategy of um, a limited amount of the liquid or isoteric instruments um, with, within, within a, uh, a liquid portfolio. Um, so to support these types of structures, technology has got to be able to segregate very clearly uh, those styles of asset within the portfolio um, and then roll up in the traditional manner and then create the share class allocations. Um, and of course, when you set up a structure like that, it's going to be absolutely critical that um, uh, you've got full compliance and then ongoing exception management and monitoring tools that would then be required at all times uh, with the creation of every NAV uh, with it. Um, we also find that um, uh, the holdings could be, uh, as well as direct uh, investments into, into a liquids and, and derivatives, um, they could be a fund to fund structure. So you might have fund vehicles um, and then also uh, alternative asset managers themselves as an equity. So a lot of the, um, uh, the alternative asset manager firms are actually uh, publicly quoted. And so uh, given the fact that their revenue is largely derived from management fees, um, which is, at the same time is associated to, to, to the success and the performance of, of the funds that they're managing, um, you know, you, you can get to the return, if you will, by going into a, a liquid uh, asset as well. So that's another uh, way of looking at it. Um, from a, a technology point of view, um, if you think about it, the, the administration for a liquid and private equity, um, it is, it is um, more complex than, than traditional uh, portfolio management. And there's a lot of events and the sequencing event, events and flows for private portfolios. Um, and it's pretty specialist as well. So, so there's, uh, I think, a small handful of specific technology that handles that very well. Um, the, the lead players, I would say, is, is my own firm, so, so FIS. Um, and then BlackRock would be another where we've made big inroads into uh, bringing these asset classes together. Um, so we, with our colleagues at Black, uh, BlackRock, you put E-Front and Aladdin. Uh, where they're successfully bringing a multi-asset class eyeball and for FIS combining the likes of Investran and Invest1 um, for that back office and ABOR and then the NAV creation. Um, from our point of view, the way we've done that is we've managed to map the flow of the data um, found in Investran, so the entities that get created in, in private equity um, into positions and sub-portfolios in, in the traditional structures. Uh, and then we can apply the relevant style of gap accounting. Uh, then this rolls up to create uh, NAVs and share class allocation. Um, we've also extended it as well um, to, to the sort of the final piece of the jigsaw, which is that credit space. So there's a lot of demand as well for uh, uh, credit instruments such as CLOs and bank debt. Um, and this requires further specialist treatment. So again, there are specific services and technology to support that. Um, so last year, we, we actually kicked off 2020 with our acquisition of uh, Virtus, and that really completes that jigsaw of um, a traditional alternative uh, illiquid and, um, and credit instruments. And so I think that that will now continue to, to mature as a service. Um, what's your perspective on the demand for managed services for asset managers? W with the work from home model or some sort of hybrid being in place for the foreseeable future for many firms, what shift in the delivery of software and solutions do you see happening in asset management space? Which firms do you think will be best equipped to take advantage of managed services? Well, I think, I think this is obviously a, 
a rapidly moving uh, subject and it's been um, acutely accelerated by the events of 2020 with the pandemic. Um, so we're seeing a, a huge shift in demand um, for SaaS um, and, and services rather than the traditional um, uh, product-based technology. So we do a couple of pulse surveys um, each year. So we're talking to uh, sort of two to 300 industry professionals to um, uh, understand their thinking of, of where they see um, you know, their business is going. So in our latest one, we saw that 60%, over 60% are now looking for more SaaS services. And one of the key reasons for this is to help relieve the work from home pressure. Um, so obviously in a SaaS environment, you're gonna get tighter controls uh, around uh, the data. Uh, you've got central, a central source of service. And of course, you, know, you can combine that with much tighter cybersecurity, uh, which is now becoming more and more critical um, as people are working in a, you know, in more of a remote environment. Um, I think this also goes hand in hand with um, the productivity and efficiency in this style of environment. So we're seeing more workflow tools, more emphasis on uh, error handling and exception management, and again, delivering this as a SaaS service with a cloud-based delivery. Um, and this ultimately then can help orchestrate the end-to-end -end tasks required uh, on a more dispersed um, workforce. Uh, the other area that we see more and more is, is uh, an ongoing increased demand for BPAS or uh, business process outsourcing, again, as a service. Um, so it's either elements of the end-to-end -end requirement. So looking for outsourced technology or outsourced services uh, as it becomes more and more commoditized. So areas such as reconciliation, reg tech, client reporting, and then ultimately now production as well. Um, across the whole industry, I think you know the back office has largely been operating on an outsourced basis, and we've seen that trend grow uh, over the last uh, couple of decades. But um, more firms now also offering middle office as well um, as a as as a BPAS. And so I think one of the critical areas here is technology continues to. Uh, evolve or continues to need to evolve to form that uh, front to middle to back office bridge. So a very um, integrated control between eyeball um, and the reconciliation of the T view in eyeball to the T plus one view uh, in ABLE, which is then driving out the NAV. Um, so the data are becoming more, um, let's say, matched and the timing differences get eradicated through technology. I think firms that have got the, a good handle uh, on those automated uh, flows um, with, um, with regard to open data um, and back office suppliers, um, they're going to be quicker off the mark, perhaps, of, of, of leading this. Uh, the, other, the other area which is key and to the efficiency of all of this is multi-tenancy. So again, combined with SaaS is having multi-tenant uh, applications so you can truly realize scale and efficiency. Um, and then that also opens up um, the, again, the evolution with more and more data demands. So things like ESG now becoming more of a, an important subject. Um, and, and a closer integration to, to the ultimate, uh, sorry, to the end investor through wealth platforms. And it, it's clear that we've seen a trend even pre-COVID to technology providers introducing full to front, or oh, sorry, full front to back solutions, I should say, in the market. What's your opinion on the viability of these models? What do you think managers are looking for as they make the transformation technology decisions? Yeah, it's, that's that's an interesting one. Um, and again, I think there is a uh, a process uh, uh, evolution. So the big firms such as FIS, um, you know, we've been uh, heavily investing um, in, as part of our strategic pillars and, and uh, our in investment strategy into platform modernization. Um, and we're now pretty much, you know, we've completed that transition. And so the result of that is a platform uh, that has been modernized um, and it's brought into a modern environment, the best of breed um, solutions to become more of a component in a full front to back end to end solution. But critically now in that SaaS world, the supplier is now taking on the responsibility 
to ensure um, things like uh, compatibility, uh, version control, and data integrity as it flows across the different components. So this, to me, this is the key issue. Um, and, and of course, the availability of these platforms becomes more accessible to the wider market. So you go more, let's say, down market, wider scale uh, via that SaaS cloud delivery and BPAS options that we start to wrap around it. Ultimately, this is going to provide a deeper functionality that's required. And it's simply not there today in solutions claiming to end and to run end to end. Um, and so if you think about it, it is more the data that needs to be end to end and joined up, not necessarily the components of the underlying platform. And that at the end of the day is what provides that holistic service. Um, and I think this is going to come to the fore in the coming years as we see more complexities uh, continue to increase in regulations, uh, particularly in areas of risk and investment strategy. Um, as I mentioned before, I think ESG is likely to pivot from an investment option to becoming more of a regulatory issue in order to qualify uh, to become ESG compliant. This in turn opens up further requirements with uh, areas such as data management, exception flows, rebalancing and risk tools uh, within the technology stack. And we were already seeing pressure on fees, the need to increase automation to reduce costs and increasing number of managers turning to outsourcing pre-pandemic. We'll have to assume that these cost pressures will remain for some time. Given the overall high cost of software implementation. And when I say this, I'm talking about not only the cost of technology, but also the resources needed for implementation. What do you think can be done to make solutions more cost effective? Yeah, this is, this is a, again, it's a great question. And it's something very topical for us um, uh, at FIS. As part of our um, uh, strategic um, organization, we've created some functional areas and professional services um, is, is part of that. So we, we have now uh, professional service guidance and leadership that we then push across FIS capital markets. Um, so as part of that uh, initiative, we are um, creating more and more out of the box style implementations. So we're shifting to more of a professional services SaaS model. Um, and we've already seen um, much of this success coming out of our, our professional services factories um, and that's enabled us actually in 2020 to deliver a lot of our services on a remote basis, which of course has been critical given um, the events that, that, that are hopefully now uh, largely behind us. Um, but what has come loud and clear talking to our customers and with our sales force and, and prospects is the market really doesn't want um, uh, open-ended implementations. So our clients don't want to take on the risk uh, and the associated cost pressures of large complex implementations. They really want it to be more of an out of the box with more certainty of the outcome uh, that they can then get. So I think what we've done um, by this shift is that SaaS applications allow us to offer more of a standard, lower cost with, with a very efficient approach to implementation uh, from, if you like, more of a preset menu and then giving our customers the choice to add additional services, uh, which can then be uh, under separate professional service agreements, but the base technologies, the base platforms, the base product uh, is in place in a very controlled uh, uh, cost environment. And advanced technology is increasingly becoming adopted across the investment community. So asset managers can increase AUM and scale as it pertains to the middle and back office. What are some of the areas that you see as the biggest application of these new technology solutions in the asset management space? And what areas may still be a few years away? Um, it's, 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 again, it's another great question because I think this is a, it's just an ongoing journey that we're all in. Um, obviously, uh, the industry that, that I serve, it is, it is technology to serve financial services. So um, I'd, I'd summarise it into two key groups. I mean, at the end of the day, areas such as uh, RPA, exception management and workflow, uh, they've been now around for a while and they're, they're continuing to become more refined, more embedded and more automated into the, uh, the BAE practices of, 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 of the firms that we serve. 
Um, but I think there's, um, you know, we're, we're currently in progress of, of expanding that RPA. So now we start to overlay it with the more advanced technologies such as um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, and, and other areas. So what that will do is start to automate the error handling, the exception management, and simplifies the data flow. So uh, the user's experience is then uh, just dealing with the data where it's where, where your uh, AI and your mechanics are now hitting unknown or new data conditions. Um, so as, as you continue to evolve, the repeatable exceptions uh, become eliminated. And of course, the more you do, the more repeatable um, exceptions that, that the, the application will find. Um, and, and this also helps solve for having multi components to an end to end solution uh, with that, with that uh, error handling. I think um, data simplification, data interpretation and automation, they're, they're all now making bigger strides of progress. And again, uh, artificial intelligence platforms that are handling the data flows um, and they're starting to ensure the integrity of data uh, to the end product. So that's why I think um, that deep functionality from these modernized best of breed component platforms is now more important than ever to become complementary uh, to, to this new world of, of artificial intelligence and advanced technologies. Um, then looking to the future, I think the uh, newer technologies, so areas such as distributed ledgers and blockchain, uh, perhaps have been a little slower to get off the mark within our industry. Uh, but we are now starting to see inroads. Um, you know, if you think about the buy side uh, transfer agency, you're starting to see the use of smart contracts and automated data flows uh, for for end to end there. Um, and I think also, uh, particularly in in our market, it's it's a shift and a change of the traditional services. So, for example, um, if you think about asset management, you've got a of the, the accounting area, we've got the transfer agency area. Um, so now uh, what we're looking at is how could we extend that? So within our, uh, our banking services, as we're getting more and more involved with things like real time payments on a global basis, is starting to extend transfer agency services, private equity services, and our, um, uh, our, 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 our corporate treasury um, division as well and liquidity division um, to to real time uh, to real time payments. So you end up with um, open banking and digital banking tools. And then finally, I think still evolving, but still more to do is then the digital distribution of the data to the end customer. So that really completes the picture. Um, and what they end up is, is with sort of very simplified views and immediate access to the appropriate data, uh, which starts to replace the traditional reporting that's obviously served the industry uh, uh, historically.